I invite you to take God's Word and turn with me to the Gospel of John, John chapter 3. And this evening I want to continue in our series a bit further, a series that I've entitled The Miracle of the New Birth. I believe that we cannot think about the new birth too much. Uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon calls it the hinge of the gospel. And we need to learn more and more about what the new birth actually is. And so for that reason, on these few Sunday evenings in this series, I have wanted to draw our attention together as a church family to this great doctrine, to this great truth known as regeneration which is the truth of the new birth. I want to begin reading in verse 3 as we continue in our thoughts on the miracle of the new birth. John writes in John 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. There may be no truth in the Bible more deeply loved and greatly cherished than the subject of the new birth. This is that grace-centered truth, clearly taught in Scripture, that God gives a new beginning to those whose lives have been ruined by sin. Can you think of anything more glorious than that? Here is the life-changing truth that sinful men and sinful women like you and me can be made totally, completely new from the inside out. Not just have an old, I mean, a new facade put on the old person, but for God to put a new person inside the old facade. When the new birth is caused by God, the Bible says old things pass away instantly, immediately. Old practices, old cravings, old habits, old addictions, old associations, they pass away. The stranglehold of sin is broken. Furthermore, through the new birth, new things come. They come immediately and they come increasingly. New desires, new hungers, new appetites, new pursuits, new passions, we become literally a new creature in Christ Jesus. An entirely new life begins like nothing we have ever experienced before. This new life is not merely an upgrade from what we have experienced to this point. It's not an improvement of the life that we have known to this point. That old life is buried, it is is removed, and there is an entirely new life that comes to us. It is a life that is not of this world. It is a life that comes down from heaven. It is the very life of God Himself. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. It is this very life of God Himself that comes down and is implanted within our once dead soul. Before we were born again, we had no life whatsoever. We were spiritual dead men, spiritual dead women. We had an existence 
but we had no life. We were empty. We were hollow on the inside. There was nothing of God on the inside. We may have been in church. We may have been in Bible study. We may have been around other Christians, but we were totally, completely empty on the inside. We were just going through the dead motions of dead religion. We were going through the empty motions of religiosity until that day, that time, by which God acted upon our once dead soul. And there was a spiritual resurrection. And we came forth from the grave of sin. And we had life for the very first time. And we became alive unto God. And in that moment, in that instant, we could suddenly see the kingdom of heaven. We could suddenly see the things of God. And in our heart, immediately, we loved the things of God. We once had been God-haters and Bible-haters and truth-haters. And now, suddenly, we had love for God, love for the Bible, love for God's work, love for God's people. It was a total reversal. And the sin that we once loved, we began to hate. And the holiness we once hated, we immediately began to love. The contrast could not have been any greater. All things are made new, top to bottom, inside out. Not just a portion uh, of our life, but from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet, every inch, every ounce of us became instantly and immediately new as the life of God came into us. What is the new birth? It has been called the life of God in the soul of a man. It's not religion. It's not church. It's not activity that comes inside of us. It is the life of God Himself. And where there was darkness, now there is light. Where there was death, now there is life. Now, this new birth is what we are looking at in this section in John chapter 3. And I I want to say still by way of introduction, this truth of the new birth, which is so loved, is also so misunderstood. Most people naively imagine that there is something that they can do to cause themselves to be born again. And tonight, as we shall look at this, I want us to see it is a glorious work of grace. Now, the last two times we've been together, we have defined and documented from these verses five aspects of the new birth. I simply want to read these so that you're, uh, to bring them to your remembrance and you can add anything to your notes to bring it up to speed. But these five elements, aspects, components of the new birth are these. Number one, it is a necessary birth. It is necessary. Uh, Jesus said in verse 7, you must be born again. He said in verse 3, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven except you be born again. And in verse 5 he says, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God except you be born again. You can go to heaven without being baptized. You can go to heaven without joining a church. You can go to heaven without doing a lot of things, but you cannot go to heaven without being born again. Second, it's a spiritual birth. In verse 3, he speaks of being born again. And this word again refers to a second birth. A second birth that is a spiritual birth. It is a birth from above. Third, it is an instantaneous birth. It's not a process, but it is a definitive, decisive event that occurs at a moment in time. You may not be able to pinpoint that exact moment, but that does not negate the fact that it, but that it occurred at a moment in time. If, there, if your life is a, a straight line, And there are the different dates and markings on that straight line of different events that occurred 
in your life. The new birth is not a parenthesis in time. It's not a season in time. It is a point in time. Just like on your driver's license for your physical birth, it's not just a year, it's not just a month that's on your driver's license for when you were born. There is a day when you were born. So it is spiritually when you were born again. There was a day when God said to your dead soul, let there be life. And then fourth, we've noted it was a comprehensive birth, meaning that the whole man, the whole woman is affected. That God gives a new heart, He gives a new mind, He gives a new will, that every aspect of our inner being is made new. There is no part of us on the inside that remains the same as it once was. It is comprehensive. It is a total, holistic new birth. And then fifth, we noted, it is a cleansing birth. In verse 5, he says, born of water and the Spirit. And water is a metaphor, a picture of the working of the Holy Spirit in regeneration. In Titus 3, verse 5, talks about the washing of, of regeneration. There is a, a washing that occurs. And Ezekiel 36, 23 and 24 talks about, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be washed, and you will be made clean. In the new birth, in that moment, as God puts a new heart within us, He first cleans out the dirty soul before He puts in that new heart. It is a cleansing birth. Tonight, I want to add two or three more aspects, depending upon our time, to this list of distinctive marks of regeneration or the new birth. So this brings us now to number six, and I want you to note in verse eight that the new birth is a sovereign birth. Here we learn that the new birth is the result of the sovereign activity of God the Holy Spirit moving powerfully and irresistibly upon the souls of men. Note verse 8. What a wonderful verse verse 8 is. Jesus says, "...the wind blows where it wishes." The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus is intentionally making a comparison between the wind and the Holy Spirit. The operation of the wind and the operation of the Holy Spirit. The movement of the wind and the movement of the Holy Spirit. What are the parallels that Jesus wants us to understand between wind and the Holy Spirit of God in the new birth? Well, I want to give you four words that begin with the letter I, just to help make it memorable. First of all, the wind is independent. Uh, Jesus says in verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes. The wind never blows where man wishes it to blow. Uh, The wind only blows where God wishes it to blow, for God is the one who directs the wind. God is the one who controls all the elements of nature. Uh, The wind goes on its own. The wind has, from our perspective, a mind of its own. It blows in one place, and then it bypasses another place. It affects one location, but entirely misses the next. So is the movement of the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God descends into a house, and it blows, and it moves upon 
one of the members of that house, but then lifts back up and it moves and blows in another place. How independent is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the new birth? A.W. Pink writes, The wind is an element altogether beyond man's control. The wind never consults man's pleasure, nor can it be regulated by man's devices. So it is with the Spirit. The wind blows, Pink writes, where it pleases, when it pleases, as it pleases, close quote. Even so is the operation of the Holy Spirit in the new birth. You and I cannot prescribe the time nor the place when any loved one whom we would desire to see come to faith in Christ will come about. The wind, or the Spirit, like the wind, will blow by its own discretion. Number one, it is independent. Its movement is independent of our desires. It is exclusive to the desires of God. Second, it is irresistible. When the wind blows in the fullness of its power, as verse 8 indicates, it sweeps away everything before it. The wind is overpowering. Those who have looked upon the effects of a tornado after it has hit a place know something of the mighty force of the wind. We who live down here on the Gulf Coast, where the hurricanes come blowing up through the Gulf of Mexico, we see something of the awesome power of the wind as it overrides all of man's efforts even to withstand its force. It overpowers everything and everyone in its path. So it is with the Spirit of God when it comes in His glorious power. When the Holy Spirit comes in the fullness of His power like the wind blowing upon a person's life, He breaks down man's prejudices. He subdues his or her rebellion. He overcomes any and all resistance. He removes every excuse. He knocks down unbelief. And he activates the will with supernatural power that overrides man's power. John Owen, the great Puritan theologian, writes... When the Holy Spirit intends to regenerate a person, He removes all obstacles. He overcomes all resistance. He overcomes all opposition. And infallibly produces the result He intended. The psalmist says, He makes us willing in the day of his power. How thankful to God we are that the Spirit is irresistible, for if he were not irresistible, none of us would be saved. None of our loved ones for whom we have prayed and to whom we witness would ever be saved if it was left up to them or some joint venture between them and God by which their resistance is not subdued. We would be helpless and we would be hopeless in our prayers for them and in our evangelism and in our witnessing to them, but because the Holy Spirit overcomes all resistance, we are people filled with hope. We have great confidence and trust in our God who does all things well that He alone can triumph even in the hardest of hearts and those who are most resistant. Independent, irresistible, invisible, number three. The wind is one of the few elements in nature 
that is invisible. When you stand outside, you can feel the movement, you can feel the power, yet you cannot see the wind, yet you feel the force of it, and it is very real, and you see the effects of the movement of the wind, you see the trees that are blowing, you see the flag that is waving, you see uh, obstacles that are being moved down a sidewalk, yet you cannot see any uh, personal force nor any impersonal force that is moving them. Things are just moving all around you, and it looks so mysterious and it looks so strange, yet it is the invisible movement of the wind that is causing all of this to happen. So it is with the Spirit of God when He is at work. We see the effects of the Spirit. We feel the effects of the Spirit. We feel the conviction of sin. We feel the empowerment by His uh, uh, might within us. We see other people coming under the conviction of the Spirit. We see people with joy. We see people with peace. And yet we look around and we don't visually see anyone who is there. Yet we know it is the invisible hand of Almighty God in the person of the Holy Spirit who is moving mightily upon the hearts and the souls of men. There's a fourth word. Not only invisible, but inscrutable. The movement of the wind is so mysterious, is it not? It defies all efforts by man to predict where and when it will blow. We turn on television, we turn on the weather, and many times they are correct with all of their scientific knowledge that far exceeded even the first century. But even man at his best cannot predict the movement of the wind, its origin, its nature, its activities are beyond our ability to grasp. At best, we can only give an explanation for it. It is so inscrutable. It captures our imagination. It intrigues our curiosity to try to keep up with the inscrutable movement of the wind. So it is with the operation of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit in the new birth. His movement is inexplicable. His movement and operation is unexplainable. He, his work is incomprehensible. It is unfathomable the way that he works and when he works. And just when we think that we know who will be saved, the wind lifts back up and it blows away to another corner and we see someone else who seems so far away from God that there is virtually no hope for that person to be saved. And suddenly, in a moment, the wind descends in a whirlwind and comes upon that soul and comes upon that heart. And in a moment and in an instant, they are born again from above. How inscrutable are the ways of God. To sum this up, A.W. Pink writes, quote, The wind blows, quoting, Verse 8, there is the fact of it, and you hear the sound of it. Pink says, that is the evidence of this fact. But you do not know from whence it comes. Pink says, that is the mystery behind the fact. The one born again knows that he has a new life and enjoys the evidences of it, but how the Holy Spirit operates upon the soul and subdues the will and creates the new life within us, he says, belongs to the deep things of God. Close quote. 
Tonight, every one of us must stand in total awe and astonishment and amazement at the independent, irresistible, invisible, inscrutable, sovereign operation of the Spirit of God. As you find yourself in John chapter 3, would you turn back two chapters to John chapter 1, and I must beg the indulgence of my Sunday school class as we looked at this this morning. I trust it will be sweeter even tonight. But in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, we have discussed this before, but I want to enter it into the public record tonight. I want to set it before your heart and your mind yet one more time because it is the perfect cross-reference for what we are discussing, that the new birth is a sovereign birth. Verse 12 is the human side. Verse 13 is the divine side. Verse 12 says, but as many as received him. To receive Christ is to believe upon Christ. And the way that we know that is the end of verse 12. Receiving Christ is defined by this synonymous parallel statement to those who believe in his name. Do you see that? But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God even to those who believe in his name. Question, how is it that some believe in his name? Why is it that anyone receives and welcomes the Lord Jesus Christ into their heart and soul? And the answer is found in the very next verse. These are two uh, railroad Uh, tracks that are running parallel, side by side, the human, the divine, verse 12, verse 13. Now, verse 13 is the key to understand verse 12. Who were born? When he says born, he's referring to being born again from above. He's not talking about physical birth. That would make no sense with what follows. It can only refer to the new birth. Now, He now will give three negatives, one positive. Note the three negatives, then he will give the positive. The first negative is not of blood. No one is born into the kingdom of heaven because of their bloodline. No one enters the kingdom of heaven because of human lineage or their family background. This especially was spoken to the Jews of this day, many of whom falsely assume that they are sons of Abraham because they are born into the elect nation, yet their hearts had never been circumcised. Not of blood. Just because your parents are born again does not mean that you are born again. Notice the next one. Nor of the will of the flesh. The will of the flesh refers to man's strivings and man's efforts, his attempts at being good enough to commend himself to God to gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven. It refers to the strivings of his self-righteousness to meet a standard or meet a mark by which he would be good enough to earn or gain acceptance from a holy God in heaven and to be allowed entrance into the kingdom. And John says that no one by the will of the flesh can ever labor to the point of gaining entrance into God's family. Then third, nor of the will of man. And the reason that 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 is so is because man's will is dead, spiritually dead and trespasses in sin. There is the bondage of the will. No one has ever been saved because they heard the gospel and they decided in and of themselves, I want to be saved. It never originates within the will of man. It cannot because man's will is in shackles, man's will is in bondage to sin and to Satan. So then how is anyone saved? How is anyone born again? Now the positive. Three negatives, now the positive. But of God. That, my friends, is a sovereign birth. 
Not of the will of man, but of the will of God. All whom the Father wills to save will be birthed into His kingdom. All this is to say the new birth is a sovereign act of the Holy Spirit who blows like the wind, who is irresistible, who is independent in His operations, causing those who are chosen by the Father and redeemed by the Son to receive eternal life. Therefore, in your regeneration, all glory goes to God. If this was a joint venture, then some glory would go to God and some glory would go to myself. But because salvation is of the Lord, because the new birth is entirely, completely of the Lord, then all glory goes to God. Let us stand in amazement and marvel at the sovereign, glorious work of grace in our lives. There's another element that I want to set before you. Not only a sovereign birth, and I really want you to, to, to get this one. I'm going to use a theological word that's not in the text. And for those who are taking notes, I'm going to spell it so you can write it down. It will be close to the English language. It is a monergistic birth. M-O-N-E-R-G-I-S-T-I-C. M-O-N-E-R-G-I-S-T-I-C. Some of you go on a website called monergism.com. That is what this word means, and I want to explain it. R.C. Sproul has told me this one doctrine, this one truth, is what separates a clear and proper understanding of the sovereign grace of God in salvation. You can, many people can talk around other doctrines that are related to this, but this one nails it where it's a closed case. Understand this, and I will say that you are well taught by the Scripture and well taught by the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I want to read verses 3 through 8 one more time. And as I do, I want, you to be, I want you to pay attention for two things. I want you to pay attention for God's part, and I want you to pay attention for our part. I want you to see what Jesus says God will do, and I want you to give closest attention, is there anything that Jesus calls upon man to do? So I want to begin reading in verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Please note in verse 3, man is passive, Man is inactive. He must be born again. Notice verse 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Here we see that God is active and man is passive. In fact, there is no mention of of man's part, there is only mention of God's part. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Lord, tell me, what must I do to be born again? You must be born again. Tell us what we must do. You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, 
but do not know where it comes from and where it is going, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Please note, the Spirit is the sole and only agent in the new birth. It is not God and man. It is God and God alone. It is not a partnership between God and man. It is solely a work of God the Holy Spirit. God is active. Man is passive. The heads and tail of the same coin is the other doctrine, which is conversion. Conversion is man's part. Regeneration is God's part. But God's part always occurs first before man's part. Conversion involves repentance and believing upon God and turning away from sin and turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is man's part. But God's part is the new birth. And it is God and God alone who causes us to be born again. Now, I said the word monergistic. Let me give you just a little etymology on this word. Mono means one. Erg, E-R-G, is a Greek word that means a unit of work. Monergism refers to one agent doing a work. Monergistic regeneration means that there is only one agent who is active in the work of the new birth, and that one agent is God. Now, the opposite of monergistic regeneration is what we call synergistic regeneration. Sin, S-Y-N, means a coming together, a, a, a synthesis, a coming together. Synergistic means that there is the work of more than just one agent. There is God at work, and there is man at work, and God must cooperate with man, and man must cooperate with God, and both have a power of veto, which in this view means it ultimately is with man, such that man remains in control and man is active in the new birth. That is the heart of Arminianism. But the Bible does not teach synergistic regeneration. There's not one verse or one shred of evidence in all of Scripture for that. It is monergistic. It is solely a work of God. Let me give you some verses from the Old Testament that strike me. A first from Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, 33. Regarding the new birth, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, not we will. I will. Synergistic regeneration means we will. God had a part, I have a part. Monergistic is there's only one part, and that part is God. In the prophet Ezekiel, he writes in Ezekiel 11, verse 19, I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. Again in Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27, God announced through Ezekiel, I want you to listen now to the singular pronoun, the singular pronoun first-person pronoun. This is God speaking. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey 
my commandments. The emphatic and repeated use of I will in each of these divine providences, uh, promises affirms that the new birth is by God's sovereign, singular soul activity acting upon the dead heart. John Owen, the great Puritan whom I quoted a while back, says, to say that we are able by our own efforts to think good thoughts or give God spiritual obedience before we are spiritually regenerate is to overthrow the gospel and the faith of the universal church in all ages. Close quote. This is to say that the new birth is by God alone. God alone gives sinners new heart and new birth. God alone grants illumination and understanding so that the lost may be saved. Owen adds that the biblical teaching is that, quote, regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit unaided by human effort or cooperation. Now, it will affect human cooperation, and it will grant repentance, and it will give the gift of saving faith, But that is the fruit. The root is exclusively a work of God's grace. Charles Hodge, the noted Princeton theologian of the 19th century, writes, quote, No more soul-destroying doctrine could well be devised than the doctrine that sinners can regenerate themselves. You know why he said this? I read at night, Uh, The biography, there's a new biography that is out on Charles Hodge. It's the new definitive biography. And at night, I I read through it, take it on the road, and read it at night to help me go to sleep. And Hodge was in a great theological battle in the 19th century against a man known as Charles Finney. Charles Finney was the man who basically invented the public invitation to get up out of your seat and walk forward at the end of the service. Before the 19th century, there was no, basically no such thing anywhere. Finney was manipulative. And he would do many things to get people to get out of their seat and walk forward. One thing was, he, before he would come to town, he had a list of the most notorious sinners in town. And during the meeting, he would have one of his associates, a man named Father Hyde, or Praying Hyde, H-Y-D-E, pray out loud for the salvation of these names while Finney is in the meeting to create a sense of guilt in the person. Then they had what was called the mourner's bench in which he would invite people to get up out of their seat and come forward and an altar call to kneel at a bench after he had preached. Now, you must understand, Finney was not even saved. Finney denied the doctrine of justification by faith alone in Christ alone according to the grace of God alone. Finney was an outright heretic. And this is what gave birth for the Southern Baptist Convention for the public invitation. And it was so bad that in upper state New York, where Finney was, it became known as the burned over district. As he just scorched the churches. And the result? Mormonism. Jehovah's Witnesses, and all kinds of cults, foul, demonic doctrines. Charles Hodge was the premier theologian of Princeton. He was the guardian of orthodoxy. He was the chief professor. He was the chief editor of the theological journal that was the most read theology at the time. And as Hodge makes this quote, 
please don't let this quote just pass you by. There is a context. There is a historical context in which Charles Hodge, who is wrestling for the very purity of the gospel and the purity of the new birth as it was under assault by Charles Finney. Listen to this again. No more soul-destroying doctrine could well be devised than the doctrine that sinners can regenerate themselves. Just get up, come forward, kneel at the bench. You can do it. And then he adds in this sentence, and repent and believe just when they please. As it is a truth both of Scripture and of experience that the unrenewed man can do nothing of himself to secure his salvation, it is essential that he should be brought to practical conviction of that truth. The new birth is not a joint venture between God and man whereby man becomes his own co-savior. The new birth is exclusively and solely an operation of the Spirit of God descending upon a person's soul. The fact is, man cannot cooperate with God any more than he cooperated with his parents in his own physical birth. In both cases, God is powerful, active, and man is feebly passive. John Murray, one of the foremost theologians of the 20th century, who followed really in the lineage of, of Charles Hodge, wrote of this new birth. I want you to hear John Murray. He has written a book entitled Redemption Accomplished and Applied. It's one of the greatest little paperback theologies on salvation you will ever read in your entire life. You can read it. It's only about 150 pages. It's a grand slam. It's a slam dunk. You ought to get a copy of Redemption Accomplished and Applied. You ought to have one in each room of the house. Listen to what John Murray writes. For entrance into the kingdom of God, we are wholly dependent upon the action of the Holy Spirit, an action which is compared to that on the part of our parents by which we were born into the world. Now listen to this sentence. We are as dependent upon the Holy Spirit as we, were, as we were upon the actions of our parents in connection with our natural birth. We were not begotten by our Father because we decided to be. And we were not born of our mother because we decided to be. We were simply begotten and we were born. We did not decide to be born. If this privilege is ours, meaning in the new birth, it is because the Holy Spirit willed it. And here, all rests upon the Holy Spirit's decision and the Holy Spirit's action. He begets when and where He pleases. Close quote. No less than James Montgomery Boyce, as he preached through the Gospel of John many years ago, writes of this same monergistic regeneration, this same soul initiative and exclusive activity on God's part in the new birth. Listen to Boyce. Clearly, God uses this image, talking about being born again, because it alone shows that the initiative lies with the Father, capital F, entirely and not with a son or daughter who is engendered. Boy says, what did you have to do with your physical birth? Did you say, I would like to be a boy and be born to Mr. and Mrs. Smith? They seem like a nice couple. Did you say, I'd like to be a girl 
five feet, six inches tall. I'd like to have blonde hair. Of course you did not. You had absolutely nothing to do with it. Instead, your father met your mother, and between them, they produced you, and you only realized what had happened afterwards. It is obvious, therefore, that when God uses this image, He does so to show that He alone is responsible for your salvation and that you believe only because He first created the life within you to do it. Close quote. Murray concludes, Regeneration is the act of God and of God. The grace of God is the only efficient cause in beginning and affecting conversion. This is an extraordinary truth. Around my house, we would say, this is big boy football. This is not touch football at the sorority house. This is not cream puff theology. This is a tall drink from a deep well. The new birth is a sovereign birth. The new birth is a monergistic birth, and I declare it from the housetops. Third and finally for tonight. The new birth is a faith-producing birth. It is the new birth that produces faith. Now write this sentence down. Regeneration both precedes and produces faith. Let me say it again. Regeneration both precedes and produces faith. It's not the other way around. We do not believe and then we are born again. It's the total opposite. We are born again, and then we believe. Now, it all happens in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, but there is a logical cause and effect that occurs in that split second. I mean, they're not people walking around who are regenerate, but they have not yet, born, have not yet believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. No, it all happens in the exact split second. But there is a cause and effect. There is a root and a fruit. There is the initiative, and then there is the after effect. And it all occurs in a moment. And the cause is regeneration. The effect is repentance and faith. We know this has to be so, because faith is the gift of God. Repentance is the gift of God. Acts eleven nineteen. God had to grant repentance. Uh, Hebrews 12, verse 2, that faith is the gift of God. Looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Who authored faith? It is Christ. Philippians 1, verse 29, it was granted unto us not only to suffer, but to believe in His name. It had to be granted to us. Ephesians 2, verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. What's not of yourselves? Not just the grace, but also the faith. God had to bestow saving faith upon us. Dead men don't believe. God had to, in that moment, impart eternal life, divine life, into our soul. And when He did, He gave us the ability to believe. In that instant, He renewed our will. Our will was dead. Our will was paralyzed. Our will was inoperative. Our will was marked by inability. Jesus said, no one can come to me, John 6, verse 44, except for the Father who sent me draws him. Therefore, regeneration must precede faith and produce faith. In John 11, verse 26, Jesus said, note the order of this. Please note the order. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? You must live before you can believe. Dead men do not believe. 
Listen to James 1, verse 18. In the exercise of His will, not our wills, plural. In the exercise of His will, He brought us forth by the word of truth. 1 Peter 1, verse 23. For you have been born again, not a seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and abiding Word of God. God planted the seed of His Word into the soil of our hearts, and God germinated that seed. God caused that seed of the Word to come alive within us. Only God can cause that seed to burst forth with life. And in the, and in the first act of that life is to call upon the name of the Lord. That is why 1 John 5 verse 1 gets the order correct. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Verb tenses make it read this way. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has already been born of God. Being born of God comes first. And in that second, in that moment, in that milla instant, there is the calling upon the name of the Lord, but it is God who induces labor. It is God who impregnates the womb of the heart. It is God who creates the life within the womb of the heart. It is God that causes the seed of the word to germinate. In the Greek language, the word for seed is sperma, which refers to that of a man, and when it is placed into the womb of the heart, it is God who causes that sperma, that seed, to come alive and to produce an offspring. And that offspring is repentance and faith. It is God who has brought it about. You know why this has to be true? Not only does the Bible teach it, but it gives all glory to God. You know what's the right interpretation of any passage of Scripture? What most gives glory to God? Whatever steals glory from God is not the correct interpretation. Because all things are from Him, through Him, and to Him. Even the new birth is from Him, through Him, and to Him. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I want to conclude by giving a few action points. If you find yourself here tonight and you have come to the realization that you're lost and you do not have Christ, you do not have the life of God within your soul, and you hear me say that there is nothing that I can do in order to be born again, what would the Lord have me to do? Stephen Charnock, the great Puritan, of England, in writing on the new birth, gives these five action points. I know we have parents who have brought children here tonight, and your children are not yet saved. Let no one hide behind the cloak of the sovereignty of God to cause them to be passive in seeking the Lord when He may be found. Charnock writes, this. Question, what shall we do to get this new birth? Answer, number one, begin with prayer. Seek it from that Savior that first made so plain a declaration of it. In John 3, 27, a man can receive nothing unless it is given him from heaven. Then, Charnock says, go to heaven and beg for it. Call upon God. Beg God. Plead with God. God, cause me to be born again. God, breathe life into my dead soul. Charnock says, go therefore to God. Give Him no rest. If you do so, it may not be long before you will hear that joyful word drop from His gracious lips. My grace, my grace will be sufficient for you. Besiege heaven with your prayers and ask God to cause you to be born again. Second, Charnock says, be deeply sensible of the corruption of your nature. 
The more we are sensible of our inherent depravity, the more we shall breathe after a real change. Can we ever imagine the necessity of a cure who understands not the greatness of his disease? In other words, the more you are aware of the disease of sin that is corrupting your life, it will drive you to seek a doctor. It will drive you to seek the cure. Look into your own heart. Look into your own soul. See how foul and evil and wicked we all are on the inside apart from the new birth. The more you dwell upon the disease of your sin, the more you will seek the remedy in Christ. Third, view often the perfection of the law of God, Charnock writes. This will make us sensible to the contrariness of our nature to God's holiness and consequently make us look for a remedy. That is one of the glorious purposes of the Ten Commandments. It is to show His holiness and to reveal our unholiness and the more we come to understand our unholiness, the law becomes a tutor or a schoolmaster who takes us by the hand and leads us to Christ that we would seek a Savior. Look upon the moral law of God. Fourth, and this is so wise, attend diligently upon all means of grace. Now, this is a rather Puritan, Westminster Confession type of expression, the means of grace. Let me just explain this before I read the quote. The means of grace are those channels by which saving, sanctifying grace comes into our lives. Uh, Grace does not come into our life through these flowers. Grace does not come into our life through the wood of, of this desk. There are... God-appointed means of grace that are like pipes through which God's saving grace flows into a soul. What Charnock says is, avail yourself to these means of grace. Come under the influence of the grace of God. Attend diligently upon all means of grace. They are the pipes through which the Spirit breathes, the lungs of the Spirit, the instruments whereby our natures are altered. He then quotes Romans 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of Christ. He says, attend the preaching of the Word of God, which is the primary means of grace. It is by the hearing of faith that the Spirit is ministered. No one can expect it who will not use the means to have it, no more than men can expect to live without eating and drinking. You want to live? Then you need to eat and drink. You want to be saved? Attend to the means of grace. Would we be warm? Charnock writes. Then we must draw close to the fire. Would we be clean? We must wash in the water. Would we be renewed? We must attend upon the breathings of the Spirit in the institutions of God. Number five, and finally, would you be born again? Charnock says, I add, study the gospel. Look upon Jesus Christ in that glass, this transforms us into the same image, and he quotes 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, that the more we look unto Christ, the more we are transformed into the same image. So he says, stop looking at yourself, look to Christ. Look unto me and be you saved, all the ends of the earth, Isaiah 45, 22. And the more we look to Christ the more we find ourselves coming under the power of Christ. He says, study the promises of the gospel. Study the blood of Christ, which is able to purge our conscience 
from dead works. Would we be born again? If you find yourself here tonight unregenerate, unconverted, though it is exclusively a monergistic work of God, nevertheless, there is responsibility on our part to pursue these means of grace. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. He says to you, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He says, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Look to Christ. Come to Christ. Believe upon Christ. And you will give evidence that you've been born again. Let us pray. This prayer will be the closing prayer. Our Father, thank you for this new birth that we can be born again from above. It is so overwhelming, it is so mysterious, it is so sovereign, it is so it is so of you. Grant to us greater understanding of this glorious truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.